Hello everyone and welcome to the Autodesk Robot Structural Analysis Tutorial brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. I hope you enjoy the video. In this video, we are going to take a look on the definition of wind loads according to the ASCE code in Autodesk Robot. Now to start with, strangely, I'm going to start with a 2D frame design. The reason being is that Autodesk Robot has a seemingly strange way of uh, assuming wind loads. This is contrast to what other softwares like eTabs do. In eTabs, you can model the three-dimensional buildings fully and then apply wind loads to those buildings on its entirety. But in Autodesk Robot, things are different. So to start with, I'm going to basically draw me one frame that is going to be representing my structure, if you want. And I can do that right now by basically, for example, uh, clicking on the Cartesian or structural axis. And basically asking for a structure that has, I don't know, columns at uh, 4, 9, and uh, 16. Now you can see that my voice performance is a little bit uh, problematic. But, well, I mean, people do get ill. Anyway, uh, in the Z dimension direction, I'm going to make me a 0, a 3.5, and a 7 meters, and maybe also a 10.5 meters and a 40 meters to simulate four stories. I'll apply that. And basically click on the members now. Now a quick reminder that this video is not about modeling structures but about how to use Autodesk Robot to define wind loads on a structure. So my structure is going to be a dummy structure. I'm going to click on the section and define me some section. It's better actually to select the type of the member first, for example reinforce concrete column and then define your section to have the corresponding correct sections. For B I'm going to assume that it's I don't know like 300 millimeters. For H I'm going to assume it's to be 600. I add that, close, and draw my columns. So I can basically draw like this, and just keep drawing. Of course, I can draw the rest, or I can copy that. I'll just basically draw them. So I'll video edit this very quickly. So basically, I video edited my columns. Now I can be, now I can define my beams. So I just click on reinforce concrete beam, and assume that my beam has the same width for practical reasons. And this is a small thing I want to like raise the awareness to. Usually your beams should have dimensions widths that are less than the columns for uh, practical reasons. It's easier to cast a beam that is smaller than the column on top of a column rather than casting a beam on top of a column when it's larger than the column. Also, if you have a moment resisting frame, having a beam that has a smaller width than the column is easy in terms of implementing the rigid connections especially if you are dealing with in situ casting meaning that you're going to cast your frame on site rather than having pre-cast frames now this is basically the practice i am using of course feel free to dispute that and tell me what your practice is i'm always happy to hear the different ideas with that regard for me i will basically let my beam have the same width as my column it's okay for the beam to have a smaller uh, cross-section in my opinion because you can still easily uh, connect the steel reinforcement with the column. However, have a, having a beam that is bigger than the column creates some practical problems at the beam column connection. Once again, I'm really interested in hearing your opinion. For me now, I just pin everything. You can also fix that, but that's not the point. I've explained before what the difference is between fixing and pinning stuff. To reiterate, when you pin something, you're assuming that the foundation is not that large and it allows for some minor rotation. Whereas when you th fix things, then the support is basically large enough to prohibit and inhibit any rotation. Fine, fantastic. Now we have our nice little structure. Of course, I can do a dry run. When you do a dry run, it will apply dead loads to the structure. And of course, you can check and see how the structure behaves. Of course, in that case, you can see that I'm using a frame because you have 90 degrees between the columns and the beams and it didn't do any releases. Fantastic. So our target today is not to simulate dead load or live load or anything. Our target is to simulate wind loads. To do that, you go to loads, snow and wind load, and you have wind and snow from 2D to 3D. Clicking on that, you can see that uh, you can basically define your envelope. If you click on Auto, Autodesk Robot will define and detect the outer uh, contours of a structure. And this makes sense because the outer layers of a structure are the layers that will be loaded by wind. The internal layers are usually not loaded by wind, except if, for some reason, you have no external walls. 
in one, no external walls in one of the um, stories. Now, why this would be, uh, maybe you have like, I don't know, an open story just for restaurant or whatever. It's really rare. If, if you have a story that doesn't have surrounding walls, then maybe you should include those into the wind load calculation. However, if you click on automatic, you can see that this robot just defined for you. Let me show you again. So if you once again click on automatic, you can see that Autodesk robot immediately highlighted the outside wall of the structure. All right, so what else do we have here? There is something called base not on ground, something called without parapets and with cavities, without cavities. Now, what about those parapets? What does this mean? Now, basically, a parapet is an extension of the wall. When you have a final roof, usually you extend the wall a little bit because maybe you have some stuff on top of the roof and maybe people will access this roof and you don't want them to fall down. So sometimes you have a parapet wall. If you say without parapets, then you don't have any parapet wall. In that case, uh, let me show you what I mean. If you click without parapets, if you define a wall that stands a little bit, you will see that robot doesn't highlight that for you and doesn't include this in the calculation, even if it's highlighted. And if you click with parapets, you can see that anything, even a chimney, gets loaded uh, on the structure. Now, I'll leave it if I were you, because it's actually better. Base not on ground is, well, as the name suggests, if your base is not on the ground, meaning that the base is not subjected to any wind loads on the ground uh, floor. All right, fantastic. Now, how does the robot do that? Well, in reality, your structure actually is has a depth. It has a distance inside of your plane. And wind loads are applied on this distance on that side, and of course, robot needs you to uh, needs you to tell it what kind of depth the structure is. And if you click on depth, you can see that Autodesk robot immediately shows you and switches to a drawing that explains to you what the depth is. Let's say our structure is I don't know, like 30 meters in depth. Now, what about base spacing? If you click on base spacing, it actually spaces you this frame. Because, believe it or not, when you generate this stuff, Autodesk Robot will calculate the loads on the 2D frame. And then, what it, what it ends up doing is, it ends up taking this frame, copy it, copying it multiple times, and applying on each frame the correct wind load based on the tributary area of the sidewall that is applied on that frame, or bay in that case. Of course, I want only to have wind loads. And my base spacing, I don't know, uh, let's say that our spacing of our columns is like, I don't know, like 4.5 meters. Notice the limitations of robot. Notice that, for example, you, the base spacing perpendicular to this frame has to be equal, which is, I don't know, like it's, it's kind of a limitation. And that's why it's actually strange how robot does calculate wind loads when compared to other softwares I worked with, like eTabs and STAD and SAFE and whatever. So, I don't know. You can think of it as whatever you want. So I just basically, before I go to generation, I have to ap apply the parameters. Of course, this now is to be studied in the ASCE code. Everything mean has a meaning. The exposure category has a meaning. The risk category has a meaning. The altitude above the sea level has a meaning. The base wind has a meaning. Now, all of those things you can find from the ASCE code. And if you, were, if you live in the United States, you have some graphs or maps that tell you those values. If you live outside, then of course you might have maps that deal with this or basically you just uh, assume a value based on the meteorological reports that you have in your location. For me, I will basically just stick to this. Now you have two options. You can generate the case or you can 3D generate the case. If you 3D generate the case, then the structure gets uh, copied and the loads get applied. So if you click on 3D generation, now it starts asking questions about what are the uh, what are the cross sections that you want to use uh, for your frame. Now you can perfectly say generate because in the end the you can later on uh, change those cross sections. So it's not really a big deal to set up everything. But still, Autodesk Robot allows you to set up the sections of each member individually. You can see that I'm cycling back and forth between the members. And you can see that those members get highlighted on this little thing. Uh, I'll leave it as is. I'm actually not caring, to be honest. Because in the end, uh, you can change them yourself when you finish. There is something called gable walls. Uh, well, the, the idea of gable walls is as follows. Now, this doesn't really work here. But basically, a gable wall uh, usually happens when you have an inclined roof. And inside the inclined roof, you have a window that is perpendicular to this inclined roof. Um, 
It's kind of what you see in the European houses when you have windows on the inclined roof and those windows are basically vertical. Now we don't have that here, so I'll leave it for this. If you click on Generate 3D, things will change because now robot will ask you to save the file into a new file because it will create for you a 3D model. Remember, I just accepted all those uh, parameters because basically I assumed that those are okay-ish for the location I am in. It's the responsibility, of course, of a structural engineer to study his location and input the um, corresponding values for the wind code. So I click on Generate 3D. It will ask you to save stuff. You can see that there are some um, calculation sheets that actually explain how the wind load was calculated. Now, you need to save your structure. I'll save it. And it will open a 3D structure. And the good news about this is the uh, calculation sheet is really amazing and really accurate. I've checked it myself. It's quite a good thing. It explains everything you want to know. It even explains to you the distributions of wind load, pressure positive, negative, because you know that there is sometimes suction pressure and sometimes compression pressure. I highly recommend you read this, especially if you are like me from an ASCE background. Each member gets loaded by the tributary area, so it actually calculates those things for you. Um, it's worth looking at. So if you close that, you can see now that my structure has converted itself to a 3D structure, despite the fact I started with a 2D structure. That's what I said about robot being strange in that regard. Now, if you click on the loads and select the case, you can see that you have multiple cases because you have left to right, right to left, up to down, down to up. There is a lot of cases in the ESCE code. And if you click on front, you can see the effect of the wind loads on the structure. Obviously, when you talk about pressure positive, the pressure comes from left to right, so the left side is applied under pressure, the right side is under suction, and the roof is also under suction. Of course, there are some pressure coefficients. For example, here, if you click from right to left, then the things change because you can see that the force is applied pressure from the right and suction from the left. Now, you need to double check all those meanings here, but in the end, it gives you all the cases that you need to consider in wind load. Of course, if you run the analysis now, your structure is unstable, and this is, as I told you, one of those strange things that robot does. Uh, it even tells you separate structures. Why? What ends up happening is, when you generated the 3D structure, robot just took the frame, and you can see it's totally unstable. Robot just took the frame and copied it multiple times and applied the forces on it. Now, when you were now, when you were considering the frame itself in 2D space, this could be perfectly stable. But a pitfall that you might fall in is that you don't understand what robot does when you generate the 3D model. When you generate the 3D model, robot converts your 2D model, which was stable, into a 3D model, increasing the degrees of freedom and increasing the number of uh, uh, possible instabilities that you can face. Now, you see, uh, one problem here is that, well, you should connect those members together I'll, you can do it manually, and I think uh, I'll just do it very quickly. So basically, you should connect those members. And for me, I'll just uh, just connect me those members, like from here to here, just to show you the gist of it. So I'll just connect this here. That's one member. Yes. And that's two members. And you can see where this is going. I can actually very quickly video edit this, and I will do that. So give me a second. Now the structure is ready, and if you run the analysis now, of course, this shouldn't be unstable. And there is not even a separate structure now. So now you have a full structure under wind loads. Now you can, now of course, I need, of course, this is 3.96 millimeters, but the scale is all over the place. So I have to very quickly normalize the scale. Going to diagrams, bars, going to uh, deformation and normalizing the scale just to make sense of it. Now, you can see even from my, like, from my tone that I'm not really um, thrilled about robots' performance with wind loads. I mean, it's nice and dandy. Yes, I know. Like, you see the wind loads with suction, everything seems to be fine. But the problem is that, to be honest, this is not practical. And uh, the reason behind this is uh, switching from 2D to 3D is not always the case. Because, our, for example, here, our structure had to have the same amount or the same spacing of base, which is not always the case. Furthermore, it doesn't allow for some special cases where you have, for example, in uh, the first bay, you don't have anything, but in the second bay, for example, here, maybe I'm interested of adding here a small, like, small house here, or small flat here. Now, those conditions are not considered in this robot, and that's why I'm a little bit underwhelmed by its ability to calculate wind loads. However, I made this video because 
some of you have asked me about giving a video how to define wind loads not using the simulation but using the ASCE code so there it is I hope that you enjoyed the video I'm sorry that this video is a little bit short but uh, it's as it's, it's as much that's what robot can do a final word I want to say here is that uh, yes I know robot has limitations when dealing with ASCE wind loads or when dealing with loan loads in general uh, I usually when I deal with this uh, do calculate my own wind loads and apply it on claddings it's tedious but the reason why I sometimes do that on a robot is because robot provides you with amazing tools that other softwares don't provide you to so yes, uh, it might be not the best in terms of wind load, at least this is a shout out to the developers there to improve. Uh, being a developer myself, I know the hard things that you are faced with when dealing with such amazing, amazing softwares. Anyway, uh, for now, Robot seems to be a little bit weak uh, in comparison to other softwares about the wind loads of 3D structures. However, uh, it's still I still do that even with those shortcomings because there is a lot of nice things that robot can do for you uh, besides having wind loads. So I don't let myself get discouraged from those shortcomings because I still use robot a lot and it saves me a lot of time. Anyway, uh, that those are those are my final thoughts on the issue. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed the video. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, and so on. Especially subscribing because it increases the range or the reach of my channel. And as per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we will catch you in the next video.